Let's see, I need some undead minions for my Dungeons and Dragons adventure. Ah, these guys, they're so dull. Wait, what's this? Huh, that gives me an idea. The night haunts are a depressing lot, but I have an army of them because my son and I went in on a box set from Warhammer called Soul Wars. He is playing the Stormcast Eternals and I am playing the night haunts. After trying to paint up the night haunts in a couple of more traditional ways, I was inspired by this assignment my son had. He was assigned by his Spanish teacher to make a sugar skull for Dia de Muertos, and the fun of the sugar skull was so enticing that I thought maybe I could make these characters whose visage is so skull-like and uh, but with a creepy twist. Um, I thought I could make them perhaps a little bit more appealing to myself by giving them a little bit of the fun that Dia de Muertos has, or at least, if not fun, a sense of um, a sort of a positive aspect of remembering those who have passed on, and in this case, be turned from the grave. A quick warning here, this video is different from other videos that I've made in that it is quite long and I am, rather than giving concise instructions for doing a particular sort of thing, I'm going to just give some commentary over time. This might be something that you would put on while you are painting and it could keep you company. So I hope you enjoy it, but if you're looking for something a bit more concise, perhaps a different video would suit you better. My first task for painting this Dia de Muertos character was to paint the actual spirit, or what I think of as the actual spirit in these kinds of figures, which is the part that uh, is under all of the clothing. And um, while I had those colors out, I base coated the places that I thought I would probably end up with bronze. I decided on a bronze bells, um, a more classic choice. But the spirit itself, I tried to paint with some bright colors and uh, to give it a sense that it is uplifting and not dragged down. So it is wearing chains and chain mail, but I'm going to try to show those in a light that gives it a, uh, while still, still a powerful and aggressive kind of paint style, uh, also a something that is kind of a positive paint style as well. This figure is an example of a project that I didn't have a perfect vision for to begin with, and you'll see as I go along that I drastically change the paint the paint style where the paint is brightest and where it has cool colors instead of warm colors. I almost reverse those colors as I'm going along and uh, to give some contrast to this, these bright warm colors, uh, I add some much cooler colors which actually brings out the bright warm colors more. One terrific difficulty I had with this model was that the inside was fairly inaccessible once put together. Uh, I don't have great skill at painting inside recesses, and so I did the best I could, but had to repaint a lot of like the chains that run down the inside of this character as I went along and I kept touching the sides of the figure in places I didn't want to touch it with the paintbrush and getting marks and paints. So this painting project ended up being a high percentage of touch-up work. This brush that I am using to sort of put down my initial base coat is larger than most that I have used at this stage and it holds a, a lot of paint, which I need to go from black to these warmer colors. 
I found as I did this model that I really enjoyed using a larger size brush. And while this brush is not very good, the other brush that I used for most of this model was the largest of my nice brushes. So I used this larger brush to just get colors on fairly quickly on the model, trying to figure out what colors I should use. Um, I used a, a blue for the clothing to contrast that orange color. And as you'll see later on, I actually incorporate blue into not just the clothing, but the spirit itself. I started with the orange color down near the ground, thinking that the spirit would grow lighter and lighter as it rose up toward the main body of the spirit to show a sort of rising lightness, but uh, I found that I needed something a little different and also I wanted to split up this blue that I used for the clothing from the blue that I ended up putting in the wispy strands of the spirit that are close to the ground and trailing behind it. While this spirit is supposed to be sort of an uplifting spirit or more uplifting than the night haunts typically are, it still is a spirit that uh, is deceased and returned from, by dark powers from the dead and so it, it is as the sculpt dictates it is shabby in certain ways so the colors of blue that I chose were not all that bright but you will also see that I paint the lining of the cloak a bright color as if it were protected as the creature uh, was perhaps buried carefully and that part of the clothing which was probably rich um, perhaps this creature was buried by a loving family and that cloth was of the highest quality and was protected so I used for that inner lining a bright red color this is partly um, sort of my take on um, or the influence of what a vampire's cloak ought to look like to me. And I know these are not vampires, but there is something quite sinister and yet refined about having that red silk lining to the inside of a cloak. When I was a child, I had a vampire costume one year and it had a red lining and I really enjoyed wearing that rich red lining and feeling creepy while having fun at the same time. And that's what I really hope for these Night Haunt characters, my whole Night Haunt army. I hope to come to the board and have it look ferocious, fierce, and menacing, but at the same time as if there is some contrast to that. For if they win the battle, perhaps they get some sort of respite or there is a positive feeling and it isn't just darkness that flows onward and onward, just, uh, regardless of who attains victory in the battle. So I guess that's one of the main points of this painting, is this contrast between the warm and cool colors that I'm painting, the blues and the oranges, and also the contrast between the feeling of darkness and dread and the reason that we care about the feelings of darkness and dread, which are those feelings of happiness, joy, love, and I want to have both of those present in this figure. When you look at your army or your figures or your character that you're painting, do you think about only the strength of the warrior or the magic of the wizard? Or do you also think of the potential frailties of those characters? Uh, is there some joy behind their ferocity? Is there something that will give meaning beyond just that they can do the thing? Are they a one-dimensional character? Or can they, um, through their visual image, can they portray a deeper backstory? 
So was it about this time in the painting process that I realized an orange, um, an orange color would end up giving my spirit sort of, of a fiery look, which is not what I was going for. I was going for a mysterious, misty look while still retaining some warmth. And so I went over it in white um, to, to get sort of a, a neutral starting point and also to give some of that lightness. Also, this does tie in a little bit better with a more typical night haunt sort of paint scheme and that more typical paint scheme is somewhat important in a game like Warhammer that has such a tradition of a certain color scheme. So while I am not going for a particular color scheme from Warhammer, I do want there to be an echo of the sort of paint scheme. I mean, these are well thought out paint schemes for these, these um, characters and these armies. So they have some great ideas in them. And this is just my attempt to make a paint scheme my own. My intention is to make the skull-like face of this character a sugar skull. And I thought I might do the same with the skull in the headstone. I ended up not doing that, but that's why I painted it white while I left the rest of the headstone uh, the orange color. When I first glued together my Night Hunt army, I did not like the feel of frailty that they have. I like the visual effect, um, but even that I didn't like at first. I didn't like quite how slender the attachment to the ground these characters have. And I, I really like that visually now. Uh, it reminds me of some of, for instance, Salvador Dali's paintings with the, uh, the very tall elephants on slender legs. It has that sort of feel of um, something in jeopardy. There is a tenuous connection with the ground and that tenuous connection makes these characters look fantastic. Uh, I am still somewhat worried when I pick up one of these characters and I feel how frail it is, uh, but maybe even that tactile sensation with these figures lends something more to the story. So it isn't just a, a visual story, but even the feel of the miniature in your hand gives a sense that this is a, a delicate construct. It may be fierce, it may be able to destroy its enemies, but it is also delicate. And I think that's a fantastic way to think of these characters. They are, um, they, they can be in jeopardy. And so painting these wisps that come off of the back of the character and the, that tenuous connection to the ground is a, a really fun moment in thinking about this character moves along through space and is sort of evaporating into the atmosphere and if its magic runs out or if its enemies damage it however they can, it will be gone. So while I went with a paler paint scheme than my original intention, I still wanted a very warm paint scheme and so I decided on white going through yellow into orange um, and you'll see later I add blue as well on the on the white end of things on the on that tenuous evaporating part of things but I wanted a more and more substantial sort of feel to the creature as it approaches the heart of the creature the center of the creature and this is important not only for the feel of what the character looks like but also for um, the eye to draw toward that central part of the figure. I want the sugar skull in the face of this figure to be the center of attention. I want the eye to draw toward that center of attention and not away from it. So the colors have to go from a, a sort of pale or maybe desaturated sort of tone to a more saturated tone. Uh, I don't think I maybe uh, fully got a transition from desaturated to saturated, uh, but 
Um, there were some very bright tones near the face, as you'll see at the end, and the face itself has bright tones, but also this gradation from very pale to a richer color in the spirit, I think leads the eye somewhat in that direction. So I started by painting sections, and I didn't do a lot of blending in the, in the first part of painting this. I almost thought of painting in stripes, and, um, and I, I worked in a little bit of blending as I went along, but the blending step really came later, and I think that's something that I'm going to try to incorporate in my future painting, is to block in colors, major color blocks of like the orange, the yellow, and the white, and then later to go into the transitions because doing all of this at once on such a large area is impossible. It is what I wanted to do at first, but the, um, the size of these areas is just too large for my ability to blend them together. So uh, I like to think of this painting stripes and then blending those stripes into each other. This area where it transitions from the spirit to the clothing. There's some chain mail there, and I like that. There are also some holes in the chain mail, which were, of course, tricky to paint. But that area was one of those places where I didn't have a great plan starting out. So this is my first figure using this paint technique or paint uh, scheme. Um, the first figure in my army that I'm trying this paint scheme with. And so I was learning things as I went along. And I learned that I needed to go back and forth until I found the right amount of color to put in. Um, I started out with this dark orange and then went lighter and tried to put some, some sort of brighter orange back in later. So as I, I would go back and forth between very pale and, um, and a little bit, uh, having a little bit more orange in the figure. I also found that the spirit, the way the sculpt works, the spirit has these thicker strands that come out. And of course, this is one of the things that makes this spirit model so neat is that these thicker parts are the parts that carry on further from the body of the spirit. And so in these trailing parts, there are sort of ridges or bulges, and those need to be more substantial. And in this color gradient that I set up, more substantial meant more orange. So these orange stripes needed to carry out further in those places where the bulges were thicker. Another interesting thing I had to work with was the places where the spirit body had actually broken into holes, and these also give a fantastic feel. But as I went along, I needed to figure out, are these going to be part of the kind of main body color, the orange that I'm building toward, or are they going to be something that is quite a bit um, less substantial as if it's, they're evaporating in on the inside and I decided eventually on that that they were evaporating toward the inside. One of the things that I struggle with when I'm trying to paint a miniature is to uh, figuring out exactly how careful I need to be as I am painting uh, early on. So I haven't painted anything on the chain mail portion but I um, I don't want to get a lot of, of color in there. I've only painted it black so far, just the base coat. And so painting the orange along the edge, I how careful do I need to be? And of course in the chain mail, it's kind of tricky because it's very hard to get into those recesses to fix a kind of mistake. So I tried to be fairly careful. Uh, however, I knew that I could go back and paint with black t before I gave it any sort of metallic sheen later. One of the interesting things with this color scheme that I noticed is that while the bulk, the kind of weight of the character is centered in the center of mass um, as it should be, the color scheme that I chose is the same color scheme as that of flame, like a candle flame. But in a candle flame, 
like in my video of the ofrenda that I made as a an objective marker for this army, the hottest colors are represented with blue and then you transition to white and then yellow and then orange and red. Um, so fire in most of its natural forms will be a, a color gradient where the greatest heat is found with the opposite color of the color that I chose for the bulk of mass in this character. But I think that is okay. I think it worked out um, to look good. For one thing, the character is wearing blue clothing, and so I wouldn't want to transition into blue and have a, um, a very small amount of contrast between the spirit and the clothing. That's another piece of difficulty I had with this character was to figure out, especially on the inside, where the spirit left off and where the clothing began. So on the outside, it is fairly obvious where there are edges. The chainmail is a great delineation between the spirit and the clothing that it wears. But on the inside, there were some places where I had to make a choice. Perhaps that was just my inability to see the difference between the spirit and the clothing. Maybe I didn't read the sculpt as as easily as somebody more experienced might, but that was one of the things I had to choose. Where is the clothing going to turn into spirit? And um, I think I f eventually figured it out. I also depended a little bit on the inside being much less visible than the outside, so I didn't worry quite as much on the inside as I did on the outside. So I was very thankful that the outside was a place where it was much easier to tell where the clothing began. As I painted these bulkier colors with the yellows and oranges, I realized that there were some pretty big bulky areas down near the, um, the headstone, and I thought I would put a little bit of orange in those to sort of show that mass and that the mass of the spirit is tied in a way that makes sense, a logical way with the colors that uh, make up the spirit. So that's something that I think is important in a miniature is having some sort of consistency or logic in most of the painting. There may be some things, and I think maybe the face on my eventual sugar skull on this character, where it stands out as not consistent or not following a particular formula, but other parts need to have enough consistency so that you, um, you're you not fighting as you look at it to understand what's going on at every possible spot. You need to have some comfort, especially in those areas where it's less important. So the, the trailing wisps need to be consistent so that later I have the capital or the, um, the belief of the viewer that something really strange and odd, like the, the sugar skull face, um, is something that they will accept and notice without feeling like, whoa, this whole thing is just a garish mess. So as I mentioned, the face is the place where I am going to use up that capital that I hope that I gain by doing somewhat careful transitions and blending and using a formula for the color of the spirit but the face, which will be white and should be orange or yellow because it's so close to the center of mass, it is the place where I will use that capital and tell a story that is a little bit surprising. Sort of like at the end of a haiku or a sonnet, you look for a twist. You don't want to have um, to get the end, to the end of a poem and it just ends with no surprise, with no reveal. I want this miniature to lead along in a, um, in a way that makes sense, bring the viewer along, and then surprise them with that unexpected face. Something else that I rely on with that sort of formula is that the arms um, which I think would look strange if they were 
orange or yellow as they emerged from the robes and then got lighter and lighter and eventually had blue fingers. I think they would look very strange. They are somewhat different from the, the sort of spirit part. And that difference is really good in that it makes the attacking end, the part that is holding the weapon, in this case the large bell, uh, has some substance to it, and so it is perhaps more threatening in a physical way. But also, I am relying somewhat on the sort of atmospheric formula of knowing that skeleton arms are bony and white. If you look at a figure like this, you expect those arms to be white, made of bone that's been bleached. And so I can get away with painting these arms white without too much extra expenditure of capital trying to convince the person looking at this model that it needs to be white. One question that I always have when I'm painting a model is how much do I finish an area before I move on to uh, a, a different sort of area? And what I mean by that is how much do I need to finish the wispy parts of the spirit before I put some of the same color on the arms or the face? Um, maybe you finish one part all the way till it's, till it's pretty much done except for any touch-up that you might have to do because of mistakes that I certainly would have to do because of accidental brushes or spots that I hadn't noticed, um, those mystery spots that you get on and you're wondering why is there a big black spot on the middle of my nice white uh, spirit wisp and you don't know where it came from. Uh, those are going to have to be cleaned up, but besides that, how do I know when it is time to switch to a different part? And usually I just follow whatever my feeling is when it's time to move from the arms to, say, the wisps that are against the base. When I feel like it's time, I just switch. And I know that I have seen some, um, some really good painters will stick to one spot until they have really brought it up to a high level. And I don't know if that is because I'm watching videos where they are trying to show a particular technique and they don't want to um, have me spend my time watching them paint an entire uh, layer of a certain color, or if they move on. But I know that I have to do something in between just for my enjoyment of painting. I've got to switch between painting the arms and painting the near the base. Uh, I think that's good when you need some dry time. It's, a, uh, it's something that actually helps the paint go on well and that you don't get frustrated because you're painting over paint that's wet when it needs to be dry for the step that you're doing. Uh, but it also is something that I think helps with seeing the model. If you're looking at the arms for too long, you will no longer be able to tell what's good and what is something that you're perseverating over when you needn't worry about it at this stage. You can leave it till later and know then what needs to be done. So flames at their hottest are blue and this transition from red to orange to yellow to white to blue is a transition that I think a lot of people see as a fairly natural transition. It also works really well, well for this model because I have blue in the clothing, and so adding a little bit of blue in the wispy parts of the spirit ties the model together thematically in color. And I used the same blue for both the coat and these wispy parts. I just added a lot more white to the blue in the wispy parts. So I didn't end up with a very different tone, just a, a different saturation of that blue. As I ended up adding blue around the edges of the wispy part of the spirit, I found that 
I could actually edge highlight sort of with the blue because I wanted the blue to be the very wispiest part. This is not how you would paint a candle or an actual flame. It is, as I've mentioned, reversed. I spent quite a bit of time, even before I really got all of the blue on the figure for the, the wispy parts. Um, there should be a name for that. The, calling them wispy parts feels like a, a silly sort of name for them. Um, but anyway, that's what I'll call them. The wispy parts. Uh, before I painted them blue, I really spent quite a bit of time blending. And part of that blending, I think, was a waste of time because I didn't have the blue yet. But it also allowed me, because there are such um, such a variety of colors, I have basically four different colors. I have the orange, yellow, white, and blue at the end. And if I tried to blend all of those together, I would worry that I would have some, um, maybe some green, where the yellow and the blue started to blend, got too close together. So having the orange and yellows blended fairly well before I had to blend the whites and blues, I think was a benefit. People do all sorts of strange things when they're painting. And when I first started painting and watching videos of people painting and trying to figure out what they were doing, I thought some of these were very strange. The strangest, of course, is the brush licking that a lot of people do to try to get the right amount of moisture in their brush or to shape the brush bristles in the way that they want so that they can get the paint exactly where they want it. And another of the strange things that people do is to paint on their thumb and I found that I've picked up that habit as I uh, always find that my brush has either the wrong amount of paint on it, maybe too much paint, or it has the wrong shape. I use my thumb quite often to get the bristles to form into a slender cone so that I have a nice tip on my brush. I also sometimes use my thumb as a color testing palette. So I have some color on my thumb and I want to see if I've actually gotten a lighter color that I just mixed up or a more darker color or how these two colors look together. So I'll sometimes put that, um, put that on my thumb. Uh, probably the main reason that I will sometimes touch my brush to my thumb is to figure out if I'm going to suddenly do a lot of damage to the miniature because I have either way too much paint or worse yet I have a, an invisible drop of water somewhere on the brush and uh, usually if I touch it to my thumb I'll get the water on my thumb instead of the miniature and so I won't have uh, a bunch of cleanup to do on the miniature suddenly from just a moment's error.
I switched brushes again and palettes as I started to do metallic paint on the bells and on the chains. Uh, I have heard that using metallic paints can um, mess up your brushes, well, leaving little sparkly flecks that you may not want in your model. And so I don't use my best brushes for metallic paints. Uh, I've really gotten interested in non-metallic metal painting. I really like trying to paint things in a non-metallic way, but I'm trying so many new things with this model that I don't want to do that. I also don't want to paint an entire army with non-metallic metals. I think that would be quite tedious, and while it might look amazing, uh, I would like to reserve that for more um, special models that are particular characters that I'm really excited about, or um, in the case for me most of the time right now, just to see if I can do it. But I've got enough to figure out with this model to leave the metallic metal or the non-metallic metal for another time. So with the chain mail, my initial intention was to paint each chain link, but I really find that difficult, and especially because I don't want to use my nicest brushes with metallic paint. I, I don't know if that's really that important, but I am avoiding it for now. And so, because I don't want to do that, uh, I'm relying on the ridges to pick up paint, and of course, get some globs in there, and I'll have to go back and, and figure out how to make it look good without painting each individual ring. Because of the festive nature of these spirits, and also because this is a special character within its unit, I plan to make this bell a highlight of really of the whole unit. So I'm going to add some decorations that go along with the theme of the sugar skull or Dia de, de Muertos but I'm uh, going to have to start out by making it a convincing metallic. And to do that, I'm painting it first bronze, and then I'm going to highlight it with a little bit of a lighter color gold. The headstone was one of my very favorite parts of this project. I started out thinking that I would do it with some sort of granite sort of painting scheme with a, then a skull in a white color inset and then paint that up with lots of color but I decided that the family of this beloved spirit would have gone out of their way to get a very beautiful kind of stone as the headstone to memorialize their loved one and so I decided to try to paint it marble and I decided to incorporate the skull so the aesthetic value of this family must have included having a skull in the headstone. I think that's always an interesting story that whenever you see a, um, a headstone in a, some sort of gothic story that has a skull, well that skull didn't appear later unless by magic and that was a conscious choice by whoever was um, laying to rest this uh, this deceased uh, person or creature and uh, so that can be a, an interesting part of the story if they did decide that skulls were a kind of motif they'd like to use as decoration well i guess that's the case with this character and the majority of this army because that's a decoration that we find a lot in the night haunts so um, going with that aesthetic and and presuming that that is a kind of aesthetic that inspires the kind of uh, light and joyous feeling that I'm going with, I would guess that they would make these skull headstones out of beautiful marble. One of the nice details on this headstone is that it also has a rose, which very fortunately goes with the story that I'm telling about this creature. So this is something that in the design of the night haunts, there is already a contrast between the darkness of the the sort of 
deathly, ghostly spirits, and also the beautiful living flowers that they're sometimes associated with. So to paint this marble, I worked my way up through quite a few grays, getting lighter and lighter, because marble is... Actually, marble has a lot of different colors, but in my mind, marble is usually a light color. When I was growing up, my parents had a beautiful marble top table that had black marble, and so I know that there are lots of different colors that marble can be, but I thought that probably the family of this, um, this creature, when it was alive, would have used a light colored marble. And to tie the minerals in with the spirit and the clothing, I decided to go with a blue-veined marble. So I started with a, a gray, and of course the orange that I had painted underneath was not the correct kind of color, so I really had to use a lot of paint and many layers to cover up that orange so that I could get to the, the more bluish cold colors that I wanted for this headstone. While I was still working in the base colors of the headstone, I started adding in a little bit of contrast between those faces of the headstone that were facing upward and would be illuminated by the sun or the moon or whatever light source came from above, and the parts that were shaded and darker. So I tried to get more of the lighter colors up on those upper faces and more um, of the darker colors down below. So uh, usually that just meant once I had covered up the orange, leaving a little bit of that under, uh, of those undersides of the edges a little bit darker. I find it difficult to paint in highlights once I've done some detail work. It's hard to switch to enough different colors of paint to really get that uh, change in contrast in say a blue vein running through a bit of marble when you have to change both the gray that's around the vein or the, the almost white, the, the very light color around the vein, and then the more bluish vein also needs to get lighter. So it is easier to paint the highlights a little bit ahead of time and I think that's one of the reasons that people use zenithal highlighting. I have not used zenithal highlighting, uh, it's just not something that I have tried out yet and so um, probably something that I ought to try out as I find it useful to do that sort of thing on a small scale with like the headstone here trying to paint blue veined marble with highlights. One of the enjoyable parts of painting a uh, detailed headstone like this is to add those little highlights to each crack and really see those cracks jump out and draw the eye. I'm spending a lot of time on this headstone and I'm putting some interesting detail and that's a risk I think because this headstone is far away from what I want to be the center of interest. But I think that with this and the bell being at opposite ends and both kind of interesting, and then the face being the center, I'll get away with it. I, um, I'm going to do something fairly subtle with this blue vein veined marble. It's not going to be a bright white marble. It's going to be gray with some blue veins, but it is a little bit of a risk to have it there far away from the face. So I started out with a light blue-gray color. I just mixed into the lightest gray that I had a little tiny bit of blue, and I painted a fairly wide stripe where I thought there might be a vein. I just kind of um, picked a, a diagonal and went across with the vein, trying to wrap around corners in a way that would uh, sort of look like the veined marble that you might see, which means that these veins, they're not like little snakes or worms, they are sheets. And so it's good to imagine that maybe the whole rat rock has cracked and that there's been some sort of um, intrusion of another mineral that's changed the rock in that area to blue. And so it would form in a, um, a curved surface that runs through the rock. But because of that, 
it will go around corners in a particular way as if you are um, cutting through something that has has a layer like a layer cake although a layer cake that has a lot of folds and bends in it starting with this very pale color i found it hard to see the veins and so um, th that was a lot of work and I think that maybe a better way to do it would be actually to sketch in with the brightest blue that I was going to use or even a brighter blue brighter than I eventually wanted it because it would get covered um, th to sketch the veins in with a brighter blue but the way I did it was to make a, a wide band of um, of pale blue and then get brighter and brighter as I got a narrower and narrower band so that I faded f from gray into blue or not faded but blended from gray into blue where each of these veins was and I made the veins kind of into a spider web so you have to imagine that is that as these sheets go through they can uh, they can crack the rock in any direction and form veins that that intersect each other. So now with a headstone that looks like it has been weathered and um, broken down, but is a brilliant blue veined marble, it needs more weathering. And I put some Agrax Earthshade on it to give it not only a little bit of um, sort of richness of mineral appearance but also to give it a little bit of a glossy sheen as if these minerals were reflecting light like stone. So that is at least one recipe for marble. Gray with lighter gray highlights, darker gray shadows, and then light gray bands with narrower, narrower blue bands within those light gray bands, and then Agrax Earthshade over the whole thing to give it that weathered, perhaps dirty look of stone lying on the ground. And then of course, with that nice blue stone with earth tones, I needed the contrast of the spirit. So I was especially careful near this stone that the parts of the spirit that run through the stone are extra bright and will contrast well with the marble. I don't want it to look like just a mess around the marble, so more contrast in this area is better. And the Agrax Earthshade, having worked so well on the marble, I decided to use it to help uh, with the contrast and a little bit of perhaps the hint of rust on the chains and chain mail for the figure. So this thin wash of paint would give those, um, those recesses a little bit of a darker tone and uh, more contrast that I couldn't paint individually, at least in the amount of time that I wanted to spend on those features that are not the most important features of this model. As I began to paint the clothing, the sort of cloak that covers this figure, I realized that it wasn't only a single layer, but was a, a multi-layered piece of clothing. So I painted some parts a much, much darker blue, those nearest the arms. And then for the back, I highlighted those parts that most directly face the sun by painting them with a lighter blue, uh, that is the I actually used, a, in this case, a dark blue, then mixed in a, um, a lighter shade of blue to lighten the blue for the highlights. I always find that I'm interested in having as many layers of highlight as I can possibly get, and I don't think that's always necessary. One of the shortcuts that I've found is that while I'm using uh, reasonably thin paint, and so I'm not getting 100% uh, opacity in each layer of paint, I can paint two layers 
in a slightly smaller area and that gives me some gradation from the darker color to the lighter color so it gives me an extra layer of, of shading or an extra layer of blending without changing colors or mixing new colors on my palette. I found again and again with this model that I'm looking forward to painting some intricate details on the model, but in order to do that, I need to paint some highlighting that is fairly realistic that will support those details so it doesn't look like I am drawing a little decoration or um, doing one of those coloring books that has a big pattern. I don't want it to look like that. I want to look like uh, a skull with with some decoration on it or a um, in the case of the cloak I'm planning to put some decorations on the cloak that are um, intricate. I, I want to paint some flowers on the cloak but I want the cloak to look like a cloak and not just a blue mat that I painted flowers on. So the highlighting is probably even more important than the flowers. I decided that the outer covering would be a simpler sort of uh, piece of clothing and then underneath would be that sort of uh, festive or um, life celebrating piece of clothing that the loving family of this creature would have wrapped um, its remains in and uh, maybe a favorite piece of clothing from life or even a, a uh, ceremonial burial garb and so those um, areas of cloth that I determined were separate cloth from the outer layer of the garment I painted in a darker blue with the intention of painting flowers and uh, I planned to paint red flowers thinking that they would echo the rose that's growing on the base near the headstone but I also considered painting marigolds as my son told me that those are a symbolic and important flower for Dia de Muertos and that was the inspiration. So as I was going along, I was just trying to figure out, well, what kind of flowers will fit in best on this character? While well, I am looking forward to painting all of the details on the sugar skull portion of this character and the flowers on the intricately decorated pieces of clothing and the bell, I find it most satisfying to paint good shading. So having a good highlight and good shade um, in the folds of fabric is really satisfying and worth spending some time on. I feel that every time I paint a new garment, I'm getting a little bit better at it. I have a long ways to go before I feel confident about painting the garments, um, but it is a lot of fun. With highlighting, I often find that I am hesitant to use a bright enough color for the highest highlight. And eventually I get there most of the time, but I think using a brighter color can be really good. And you can always back off by painting over it a little bit with your darker colors, but a bright color will give a nice bright highlight and really show off the um, contrast, the, the shape of your garment or figure. Now the rose on the base is a little bit problematic. It's a great detail and I spoke before of how I like the contrast between the death inherent in the character and this life growing up near the gravestone. That's the kind of contrast that I'm going for for this figure overall. But I have a visual problem here. This is the only green I'm planning on this figure, and the bright red in that placement draws the eye away from the center of interest that I want to be the body and particularly the face of the character. 
the best way to deal with this would probably be to use a darker tones, um, perhaps desaturated tones, and um, to highlight very subtly with, um, with quite a few shades, but all of them dark, so that there is no glaring contrast. That's not what I did here, and I do think that one of the weaknesses of this paint job is that the rose shows up just a little bit too much. Part of that I will alleviate by basing the figure with some other interesting but not quite so bright flowers. Because it's not near the center of interest of the character, I only used a single highlighting color for both the foliage and for the petals of the flower. I finally reached the part of painting this figure that I've been looking forward to, which is adding those decorations that I associate with the art that I have seen from Dia de Muertos. And I started with painting the flowers on the decorative cloth on the figure's arms. I thought initially that I would paint red flowers, but I decided that to keep with a theme of um, with a the color theme, I kept the red on the inside and put blue on the outside. So there was the red lining on the inside and I, I felt that red flowers might echo that in a way that made it feel like there was some sort of internal um, uh, weakness in the cloth or, or some sort of bleed through that at first glance would not look like purposeful decoration. So. I painted the flowers a brighter blue on this very dark, almost black blue that I made of these, these parts that I kind of thought of as the sleeves, even though it is a garment underneath. I started out by painting a simple dot for the center of each flower. These flowers are something that I actually dreamt about. It took me more than one day to paint this miniature, so I woke up one morning, um, the morning in between the, the two days that I painted this figure. I actually had dreams about how these flowers would look, and boy, were they fantastic in my dreams. And then when I started painting them, I realized that I couldn't control the brush quite as well as I would like. Maybe someday I will be able to, but at this point, I just don't have that much brush control. I don't know exactly how the bristles will move as I change the angle of the brush. So I just did the best I could. So I painted these alternating dots. So there would be two rows of flowers and that the flowers would not line up side by side, but would be offset. And um, so I painted the dots and then painted strokes to represent petals around them. I tried to uh, paint petals, the, the same number of petals in the same places by making little sections of, uh, of a circle around that central dot. So, I, um, so each petal, rather than radiating, like maybe a daisy type flower, was uh, meant to look more like a rose and, um, or maybe like a marigold by s circling the center of the flower. Uh, at first, this, uh, this kind of looked like a one-eyed smiley face, and then I gave it eyebrows, and eventually I got a number of petals that I was fairly satisfied with. I did practice these flowers a couple times on just a flat surface, trying to get a simple flower that I could reproduce multiple times. I didn't get really reproducible flowers with my level of skill, and um, yet they still look fairly good at the end they look like a bunch of flowers on a decorative piece of cloth, and that is what it's going for. So I count it a success. After I'd painted the flowers, the cloth still looked too bare. There were too 
large of sections between the flowers that were just the plain color and they needed more decoration. So I added a little bit of decoration that I thought might look like a few leaves or um, a stem or buds of a flower, just a simple series of dots to give the impression that this pattern was flowers and something else. Now unfortunately, while the center of my design for this character is the sugar skull that constitutes its face, I did not have my camera working when I painted the sugar skull. Something went wrong and I don't have a video of painting the dots, the decoration on the face, but I've painted some flowers in a manner similar to how I painted the flowers on the cloth, but I used different colors. Um, for those, I didn't try to get a semicircular petal, but instead simply used dots. I referred to quite a few pictures when I was painting the skull and one of the things that really allowed me to tie it together to finally convince myself was the sort of mustache shape that I've seen on so many people dressed up for Dia de Muertos in pictures and that uh, felt like I finally tied together these strange decorations on the face into something that was a celebration of what this person may have looked like in life and reflected a celebration also of this character in an afterlife. In this case, a dark and somewhat sinister one, but one that is still filled with some sort of at least hope for joy. For the bell, I painted very similar flowers to what I painted on the underlying piece of cloth, but in this case, I used red. Um, I started with red and then gave some highlights in orange to give some depth to the painting. Uh, I was kind of thinking in this case of the sort of toll painting that people do to decorate um, pieces of wood, uh, like the Scandinavian wooden horses. Um, that's, that's kind of the look I was going for there. I painted only four of these flowers and then decided that to echo the colors of the flower down near the headstone, I would paint a little bit of green to give it some foliage, which ended up making the bell look a little bit like a Christmas bell, which was not my intention. Uh, it seems that I am mixing up all sorts of uh, cultures, traditions, and times of year, but this is a festive character, and I do like how the bell ended up turning out, along with the face and the underlying cloth, and the character in general. Adding those orange highlights over the red petals of the flower allowed me to do a couple things. One is that it allowed the flowers to really show, um, show up as something more than a very simple design, but maybe something put on by a, somebody who was taking a little bit more care with the bell. But also they allowed me to break up the petals that had gotten a little bit too wide. So adding the, the orange detail really helped those flowers out. Finally, to base the character, I actually glued dirt on early on in the process. This is dirt that I have uh, sterilized and dried in my oven for several hours, and uh, I actually produced quite a stink in the entire house while I was doing that. I think there was some sort of material in the dirt that uh, decided to, um, to create some smoke as I I didn't turn up the oven too high, but it was hot enough that, that I did produce some, some smoke in the house and had to open the doors and get that smoke out. Um, so I glued it onto the base, partly to make sure there was no seam between the figure and the base. Um, and then I painted it a dark brown and then a 
lighter brown, and I made sure that I didn't have any of those bright colors in the part that is supposed to be the bare ground earth that the headstone is resting in. Uh, I did not want to have, uh, for instance, blue spirit color on the dirt. So I took some time trying to fix those little spots that uh, might give the impression that that is the, the uh, leaking of the spirit into the dirt. Uh, I then gave a dry brush of an even lighter color of brown, mixing a little bit of tan in with the brown. And because I was going to add some tufts, I decided that I would use those to cover up some of the places where I couldn't quite get the base to look right. So uh, the tufts uh, were going to go around and help me by hiding some of the ugly bits. At this point, I was still thinking that I might place an ofrenda around the character and uh, actually have the ofrenda as part of the base, but I decided against that. I decided to make it a separate piece that I could use as a, uh, an objective marker. And so that I show in a different video, uh, but I'll show the two together at the end of this video. I had some tufts from, um, from a package that have flowers on them, and they are yellow flowers. And as I said before, my son let me know that marigolds are an important part of Dia de Muertos, and so I imagine these are marigolds planted by the family around the headstone of this departed loved one who is now rising up to defend the ofrenda that they have left for him against perhaps a marauding troll or uh, some other creature that's just hungry for some bread. And so to finish off, my first ever Games Workshop miniature that I have completed, I painted the base rim black to give a framing effect to the work I've done and to set off the miniature from its surroundings. I've enjoyed painting this miniature and I hope that I enjoy painting many more Dia de Muertos inspired night haunts, giving them a feeling that will be more enjoyable to me than uh, the ori original color schemes that I thought of and um, I can imagine them now going forth to protect the land of their descendants. If you've made it this far through the video, you have quite a bit of endurance. Thank you for putting up with my extended uh, ramble and uh, thank you for your valor.